Hi, I'm Andrew Human. I'm going to take you through a series of video tutorials introducing Grasshopper, a visual programming interface for Rhino. Over these tutorials, you'll build on your existing capabilities in Rhino and learn to build parametric tools and work with data to make your modeling faster and more intelligent. First, I want to introduce the general idea of visual scripting. When you're working in Rhino, you're typically doing what's called direct modeling, specifying the placement, form, and composition of model elements through commands and clicks. Scripting allows you to access nearly all the same functionality, but instead of drawing and modeling directly, you're writing a series of instructions in code for Rhino to execute in order to create a model automatically, sort of like stringing together many Rhino commands at once. Visual scripting, like you're going to be learning in this series with Grasshopper, is a more accessible and designer-friendly form of scripting that's nearly as powerful as classic textual programming. So let's take a look at the Grasshopper interface and build our first definition, which is essentially a script or a series of instructions for Grasshopper to execute. So within Rhino, uh, you should already have Grasshopper installed. Go ahead and type Grasshopper in the command line, and you should see this little loading screen come up. Grasshopper is a plugin for Rhino, so it always lives on top of and inside of Rhino. So this window is the Grasshopper editor. If it ever goes away, you can just type Grasshopper again, and it should already be loaded up. Um, and I want to just introduce you to some elements of the interface. So uh, we've got up here our toolbar or component library, which has all of the components or elements that we're going to be able to use to string together to create scripts. Uh, we've got our preview settings over here. I'll talk about preview in a little bit. Um, and we've got what's called the canvas. So this kind of beige area is where you're going to be constructing your scripts visually, uh, which will allow you to control uh, your Rhino environment. So let's go ahead and build a very simple definition um, by dragging our first few components onto the canvas. So the first one we want to use is a slider. So I'm going to go find number slider over here, and we're in the first tab. Your tabs may look like this. You probably have fewer of them than I do, but one that says params over here. Um, I like the icon view. You can switch it to that if you like. Um, but over here under input, we have what's called a number slider. And as soon as we do this, those little most recently used files go away, and we have a little interactive object which creates a number between 0 and 1. Um, we're going to drag another element onto the canvas, which is one of these uh, yellow scribble panel objects. Yours might come out yellow, uh, which is a way to both input and read out data. So you can either type in here and type instructions like, hello, uh, or you can feed data into it and preview it this way. So anytime you see one of these little half circles, that indicates that it is a parameter, um, which is something that you can wire together in order to construct your scripts. So anything on the left side is going to be an input. Anything on the right side is always going to be an output. And we can see that the slider only has one on the right side, because it doesn't take any inputs, but does produce an output. When I hover my cursor over this output and drag, I have to click and drag, uh, you'll see it kind of snaps into that input. And if I release with it connected, you'll see that now this panel displays the value that the slider is currently showing. And as I drag my slider, that value updates. So one of the things about Grasshopper is that everything is always being computed every time you do anything, which is one of the things that makes it very powerful, as you'll see. So Let's go ahead and construct something a little more interesting than a single number. Um, we are going to create a circle. And everything we've seen so far is in this first tab, params. But we're going to go over to the one called curve. You might have the icon, or you might see the word curve. Uh, and we're going to look under primitive. Um, and you can click on the sort of black lower bar here in order to pull down what the options are. You can grab a circle. So this is a lot like going into Rhino and typing circle. It asks you for information. So where is the center of the circle? Uh, in this case, I'm going to say 0, 0, 0. And the radius is, let's say, 10. So that's how we would do it in Rhino. In Grasshopper, rather than typing in values for those inputs uh, to the command, each one of those parameters of the command is represented as an input on the component. So one of these is a component. So if I connect 
the output of my slider into the radius input of this circle component, and I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see over here in Rhino, um, as I adjust the slider, the circle updates automatically. So another thing to note here is that the preview, the sort of three-dimensional information that's being created in your Grasshopper script is always going to show up in your Rhino environment, although you can't select it or click on it or do anything with it. We'll talk a little bit more about how to get geometry out of Grasshopper and into Rhino a little bit later on. Um, but this is how we're going to construct geometry that is parametric, that is to say, variable, stuff that we can adjust live. So we've created a circle. Um, now we want to see, do something else with this data. And I often, especially when I'm just getting started, like to use these panel objects in order to get a sense of what data is going in and coming out of any one of my components. So if I plug the output from circle into this text panel, you'll see that it tells me that I now have a circle with a certain radius. I can adjust this as well. What if I wanted to make that circle bigger? I would need to have a slider that would allow me to go larger than one. So if you either right-click the slider and choose Edit, or you can double-click the name of the slider, or you can just go into Values. I like to just double-click. You can specify the minimum and maximum values. So let's make this a little larger. I'm going to choose about 100 and we'll click OK. You can also limit it to just integer values, like round numbers, um, or only even or odd numbers. Those are a little bit less useful. Specify how many uh, decimal places they have, um, and then click OK. And now I can make my circle much bigger. So we're going to do something with this piece of geometry data, um, which is we're going to create a series of points all around its perimeter. So also under the Curve tab, you might still be in it. I had to return to it. We're going to look for Division and go find Divide Curve. And so uh, as you're learning, it's really useful to get into the habit of reading your component. That is to say, trying to understand what it's asking you for and what it's going to give you. So with any component, you can hover over the middle of it to get a description of what it does. Here it tells me it divides a curve into equal length segments. And you can also hover over any of the inputs or outputs to get specific information about what it wants. So when I hover over this, it says it's a curve to divide. It's asking for a number of segments. And it's asking whether or not to split the segments, segments at kinks. We don't need to worry about that one for now. We really only care about the first two inputs. And the reason we can ignore the third input is that when we hover over it, you can see that there's already one locally defined value here, which is false. Um, we'll talk about data types in a bit, but essentially there are already a, there's already also a predefined number of segments. So as soon as I plug this circle curve into divide curve, it's automatically created 10 points around the outside of it. So um, similarly, when we created our curve earlier, it also had a default input of the world xy plane. At a certain point, we could also create circles that were located elsewhere, and in fact, we're going to do that next. So I'm going to create a new instance of the circle component. And this time, instead of just relying on the world xy as my origin point, you can see if I hover over this input, it says it's asking for the base plane or origin point of that circle. This time, I'm going to use these points that I just created in order to create 10 circles at once. Similarly, I can grab another slider. Um, this time, I think I'm just going to copy and paste. So I often do this rather than constantly going back up to the toolbar. I have various quick ways of recreating elements that are already on the canvas or searching for ones that I need. So I'm going to grab this slider and hit Control-C, Control-V to make a copy of it and go plug it in as the radius. And so now you can see that it's manipulating all 10 of those circles at once, and I can create some nice patterns. Um, now, all of this, as I said before, is always being recalculated. 
So I can make any modifications to any of the inputs of any of these components, um, and everything should change automatically. So if I start modifying the radius of the base circle, the positions of all of my smaller circles change with them. So this is really the kind of central concept of Grasshopper, is that you're setting up a parametric model, a model with variable parameters that you can change on the fly and have the entire model be recomputed immediately. The one other thing to know is that Grasshopper files are totally independent of your Rhino files. So uh, I can have an open Rhino file, but this information will not be saved or stored within it. So if I want to reuse this definition, I can go to the File menu and choose Save, uh, and I will save it as a .gh file, that's a Grasshopper file. Uh, similarly, I can also go open existing files that I've saved, and all of the ones for this tutorial series should be provided to you. So if you ever get lost or want to pick up from where we started during any given tutorial, you should be able to just go file open, find the grasshopper file, uh, click open, and it should load back up. Um, you can ignore that little dialog that just came up. So this is the next thing we're going to be looking at. Um, the one that I just went through is called O1 Interface Basics, and it should look just about like what we just created. So I'd like to introduce one more concept. Uh, this is the idea of a hierarchy of geometry. Um, in general, mastery of Grasshopper is all about learning a new way of thinking about modeling. And in this way of thinking, you're always building up complex forms from simple ones or deconstructing complex systems in order to operate them in a more simple form. So you can start from numbers, build up points from which you can derive curves, which you can turn into surfaces, which you can turn into more complex poly surfaces. And you can start from any one of those types and break it back down into its simpler types in order to perform simple transformative operations on them. So it's a lot like taking geometry in Rhino and exploding it and then rejoining it, um, but it takes a special sort of understanding in order to be able to work with those things parametrically. So I think this is probably easier to demonstrate rather than talk about, so I'm going to switch to one more live example in order to show this in action. So. We're going to go ahead and build another simple definition. Here I'm starting from scratch. Uh, this is going to correspond to the file called O2 Co Composing Geometry, if you want to study it in more detail. But we're going to start with numbers, build up points, build up curves from those points, build up a surface, and then a polysurface. And I'll show you all of those steps. So we're going to grab uh, a component we already saw called the, the number slider. Um, and we're going to drop this down, and we're going to need to modify its range. So let's set its max to something like 10. I'm going to make two copies of this. So we now have two numbers. I just use Control c Control v to make a copy of that slider object. And now we're going to construct point objects. So uh, in order to construct a point, uh, you have to go to the Vector tab, uh, Point, Construct Point. And you'll notice that all of my components will have this little floating uh, indicator. Yours probably will not. I have a special option turned on. Um, but what you want is if you get lost at any point during the tutorial and you need to find a particular component, um, you can always double click and search for either the nickname of the component shown here or the full name, which is what's going to be shown above it. So if I search for construct point, uh, you should be able to find the corresponding element uh, that you need. So I'm going to construct a point where this is going to control the x-coordinate of that point. And you'll see as I drag this around, the x-position of the point changes. And I'm going to construct a second point. So I'm going to just copy and paste the same element and also connect this to the x-coordinate. So I now have a different value controlling the x-coordinate of this point. And with those two points defined, I can now construct a line between them. So under curve, primitive, line, it's also right here, this line component takes two inputs, A and B, which are both points, points the start point and the end point in order to construct this line. It might be a little hard to see. I'm going to use F7 to turn off my grid. Now you can see the line that's been constructed between those two. Now, I want to construct another line, um, but I'm going to base it on this one. I could just copy and paste this whole thing, and you might play with that, um, 
but I think I'm just going to take this one and move it in a different direction. So I'm going to go under the Transform tab. It might look like XForm in your interface. And under Euclidean, I'm going to choose Move. And now here, we're going to need to look at what this component needs. So it's asking for a piece of geometry. And in this case, anything, a point, a curve, a surface, a mesh, a polysurface, these all count as geometry. So we can move any of those elements. Um, and it also needs a vector by which to move that element. So vectors are one of the data types that doesn't really show up in a Rhino context. Um, so we're going to need to construct a vector. A vector is a lot like a point in that it's a sort of x, y, and z coordinate. Um, but it doesn't represent a position in space. You might remember from physics or other classes that a vector represents a translation in space or a sort of difference between two positions. So when we want to talk about moving something, we can use a vector to represent the direction and magnitude by which something is moved. So we're going to need to construct a vector. Um, we're going to go to the Vector tab. And we can construct one just like we did construct point by supplying values for x, y, and z. Or we can use one of these unit vector components. So I'm going to use the unit y component, which is going to be a vector in the y axis direction. But it also takes an input. For that, I'm just going to copy and paste a slider. And this is going to control the magnitude of that vector. So if I plug this into the move component and now adjust my slider, I'm moving that line by a certain amount. Now, in Rhino, if you have an object like a line and you use the move command, it moves and the old one is gone. In Grasshopper, because we might always want to refer back to this data, even though we're moving something, it operates kind of like a copy, or it can seem more like a copy, in that the original still exists and is still a part of your definition. So move is only outputting the moved copy, but the reality is that these operations in Grasshopper are never destructive of the data that came prior. So you're always winding up with sort of a new modified or transformed copy whenever you apply any kind of a transformation. So we now have these two lines. And we'd like to use the equivalent of the Rhino command loft. So uh, I can show you where that is in the tab. But oftentimes, when I am looking for something that's a lot like a Rhino command, I'll just use that double click search shortcut where I type in the name of the thing I want. And usually, your first bet is going to correspond to the equivalent operation. Now, in this case, I happen to know that loft lives under surface and freeform and loft. So I can just drag that as well. And you can see that it's asking for curves as list. We haven't really talked about lists yet, but we will in a second, um, which are going to be the section curves of our loft. So that means we need to create a list from this curve and this curve, which are each single items. The next video will be concerned exclusively with lists, so don't worry if this seems a little bit strange. Um, but we're going to use a special component under sets um, called merge, uh, which should be under list and where is it? I can never find it. This is another case where I will probably just search for it. It might live under tree. Yeah, there it is, tree merge. So merge is a component that allows you to combine multiple items into a list. So I'm going to grab this first line and this second line and plug them together. And now you'll see that it is outputting both lines at once as a list. And if I plug these in to the loft component, it is now creating a surface that's lofted between those things. Now, of course, because this is all parametric, if I make modifications to my definition, uh, then that loft will change. You'll also notice if I accidentally drag this to an invalid value, if the distance between these two points is 0 and it can't construct a line, um, then this component turns red, which gives me uh, the idea that something has gone wrong. This is an error message. And this little red bubble in the upper right, if I hover over it, it'll tell me solution exception index was out of range. Now, that's not a super useful error message. A lot of the error messages are a little bit more descriptive than that. But if 
you are running into trouble or something is happening in a way that you don't expect, look for any components that are orange or red first to try and track down the issue. So as soon as I provide a valid value, that loft component works. And lastly, we're going to extrude this loft in a direction. So we could either search for extrude or we can go find it under surface uh, freeform extrude. Now extrude takes either a profile curve or a surface to extrude, and then just like move did, it takes a vector to extrude by. So I'm gonna go into a perspective view in Rhino, just so we can see in 3D now that we're going to extrude it. I'm going to supply this surface as the basis of the extrude, and I'm going to need to construct a new vector. I think in the example file, I've used a unit Z, which is just like a unit Y, only it's parallel to the Z axis, but this time, let's do something a little different. I'm gonna use construct vector with vector X, Y, Z. And I'm gonna copy my slider a few times. Let's just do Z to start, plug it in, and now you'll, you'll see that this controls the Z magnitude of that extrusion direction. But I can also do things that would be a little bit harder to model right off the bat, like a sort of sheared volume. This would probably take a series of commands uh, if we wanted to construct it in Rhino. So all this is to show that from something as simple as a few numbers, and we could control these numbers any way we want. You know, we could start to angle them or manipulate them. Um, we now have a series of parameters that are driving these operations, which go from numbers to points to curves, which become surfaces, which become polysurfaces. So oftentimes working in Grasshopper will look a lot like this, where you're basically turning simple stuff like numbers and points into more complex stuff like meshes and polysurfaces. So I think that concludes this intro tutorial. Uh, the next one is going to look at lists and data management, and I look forward to sharing it with you.